This is your first clue that the person who lives here might be a little unusual. It's a climbing rope on a steep roof. Inside, climbing books, an old mountain boot, plaques, and posters. These tell the rest of the story. This is the home of Ed Viesters, probably America's greatest living mountain climber. The key word, of course, living. And I've always said getting to the summit is optional, getting down is mandatory. Feasters has already achieved one of his goals, climbing all 8,000 meter peaks, that's about 26,000 feet, including Everest, K2, Annapurna. And he lived to tell the tales. Um, how many times have you climbed Rainier? I've climbed Rainier 206 times. Does it get boring? No, because you know what, the people make it different and the conditions make it different. And if it was boring, I wouldn't do it anymore. How many times have you climbed K2? Only once have I climbed K2. And uh, it's one of those mountains where if you climb it once and you succeed and you walk away, you know, my, my saying is you don't bother to go back. Because? It's very challenging and very difficult. And uh, there's a lot of risks involved with K2. I mean, a lot of people attempt K2 and most of them fail. Uh, when we went in 92, nobody had climbed it since 1987, despite 30 separate expeditions. And so we felt very fortunate that we got to the top on our very first attempt. And isn't K2 a mountain from which some people never return? Yes, it's got one of the highest uh, success to mortality rates. But, you know, I always tell people it's not really the mountain, it's, it's, it's the people that go to those mountains. It's, it's based on their ambition and what they're willing to do for the sake of success. And K2 is so alluring. It's kind of that holy grail of mountaineering that people are willing to risk a lot to climb to the top. Is down harder than up? It's, it's quicker to go down, obviously, but it's still very difficult because they've used all their resources and supplies and then emotionally they kind of let down their guard. You're exhausted, it's late in the day. Uh, you have to be just as careful, if not more, going down than you do going up. And, and, and again, the descent is critical. Uh, it's got to be a round trip. And sometimes you say you climb without oxygen when on mountains where others would really not be able to go without bottled oxygen? Yeah, you know, the rule that I kind of made for myself years ago, even before I went to the Himalaya, was I wanted to challenge myself more and I wanted to try to climb these mountains for what they were. And so that rule for me was not to use supplemental oxygen. Uh, I, I, I knew I'd have to train harder, I'd probably have to suffer more, but I thought it was more respectful to the mountain. What's it like when you get there? What's it like at the top? It's extremely satisfying when you get to the top. Um, I mean, the first feeling that you have is this moment of relief, knowing that you don't have to go up anymore. You get to start going down. But it's this very uh, satisfying, rewarding moment. I think of mountain climbers, I think a lot of people do. They're, they're macho, they're danger seeking, they're adventurous. Um, but you don't sound like that. No, I, I think that's not what I want to be. I mean, I love the adventure, but you have to have humility and respect for nature and the mountains. Uh, you have to plan, you have to prepare, and you have to be very patient as well as tenacious. And you have to know how to temper your ambition. You know, if conditions don't allow you to go to the top, I've turned around from the summit of Everest 300 feet away, and I knew that was the right decision. Although I wanted to continue, you know, conditions were telling me otherwise. We caught this moment with Ed at SeaTac in 2004, saying a long goodbye to his wife Paula and his children. It gets harder and harder as the kids get older because they realize that I'm going to be gone for a while and I miss them and they miss me. Feasters was headed to the Himalayas to climb Everest one week and Annapurna, the world's most dangerous mountain, the next. Do you worry about him? Yeah, I do. What, uh, what concerns you the most? Uh, well, it depends on the mountain, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I completely trust him and his abilities uh, as a climber. It's just that there's stuff that happens up there, especially mm -hmm. on the north side of Everest. Mm -hmm. With the, the ice fall worried me the most. Have you been near death on a mountain? Well, the one closest call I've had on uh, a mountain was on K2 in 92, when I was there climbing with my friend Scott Fisher, also from Seattle. And 
we were climbing on a day we normally wouldn't have. We were on a rescue to go up and bring a climber down. And, and because of the conditions, um, we got caught in avalanche. And we both tumbled with this avalanche for a few hundred feet and we were roped together. And I managed with my ice axe to stop myself. And then the avalanche kind of kept going. And, and, then, and then the rope came tight and I stopped Scott as well because we were connected. And that is the closest I've ever come. What's the biggest mistake you ever made on a mountain? That happened on K2 as well. Uh, it was later in the climb and we were going for the summit. This was a week or two after the, the avalanche. And we started climbing, conditions were good. And it, and it was gonna take about 10 hours or so to get to the summit. And about halfway into the day, uh, a storm came in and it started to snow. It was very warm and very calm. And I started to already evaluate, you know, six hours later on the descent, what would the conditions be? And, and I knew with all that new snow, the avalanche conditions would be terrible. And I kept telling myself, Ed, you've got to just turn around now before it's too late. And I asked Scott, my other partner, and, and, and they were so focused, I think, on going up, they hadn't yet thought about the coming down. And so they weren't going to help me make the decision. And the problem was, is I never made the decision. I knew I was making a mistake. We kept going to the top and on the descent, it was horrendously bad. What do you think about death? Well, death can happen anywhere at any time. You know, people think that what I do is dangerous. Well, driving a car every day is dangerous. And, you know, you can't live your life risk free. You know, for me in the mountains, that's this arena that I've discovered where I can really test myself. And I, I don't seek the death. I don't seek the risk. I know it could happen. Uh, but I just don't even think about it. Do you have three lungs? I mean, is there something physically that makes you just this extraordinarily successful climber? I didn't know that when I started, but as it went, as my career went on and I was successful at high altitude without oxygen, they, they studied me at the University of Washington and uh, they discovered my lungs are larger than normal and I have a high VO2 max. You know, my oxygen uptake is, is very efficient and I have also a high anaerobic threshold, meaning that I can go and go and go before I be go into anaerobic conditions. And so all those things innately I had uh, without knowing it. It takes much more than a gift for climbing to reach the tops of mountains. You have to stay in shape, and Beasters does that, mixing cycling, running, and weightlifting year round. Andy says he eats a balanced diet, but nothing special even when climbing. But you know, there's so many of these products out there that are supposed to be good for you. Uh, and, and you can barely eat them at sea level, let alone eating them up at 26,000 feet. So a lot of them don't work. How did you know that you had this whole world of, of, of climbing that you were going to succeed at? I never knew, I didn't know. I mean- How'd you find out? You know, I read a book as a kid. I read Annapurna, this amazing story written in 1950, growing up in Illinois of all places. Fairly flat. Yeah, I call it the, the great mountaineering state of Illinois. And uh, I said, you know, that's something, this climbing, this expedition stuff fits my personality. It's physical, there's planning, there's preparation. You need some mental fortitude. It's adventure, you're outside. Um, and I tend to be stubborn anyway. So I like things that I can really kind of sink my teeth into. So climbing became this perfect outlet and I started as a hobby. And never did I know that I would have done what I done. You know, it was just a step-by-step, year-after-year process that I kind of decided to do as I went.